the 11 people who actually read my blog. <laughs> um, no, really, it's, it's an honor to be here, and I will admit I accepted this invitation uh, with a selfish purpose in mind because this is a topic I'm really excited to learn a lot about and not something I consider myself to know anything about. Um, so I was thinking in preparing this talk about what I could offer this community in this room, um, and I thought, well, you know, I'm an engineer who has come through a computer science background to essentially uh, now do computational social science, where we study human behavior at the scale of human behavior uh, through the lens of the data we see from this system we built. So maybe what I can talk about that would be interesting here is that perspective. So how engineers and startup people think about preservation when they think about it at all. Which is not that often. <laughs> That's the punchline. Um, but to set the stage, um, the, the job I have, to, well, chief scientists have existed for a long time, but data scientists have not. Uh, and so it's pretty exciting to think, even five years ago, uh, what the world looked like and how different it is today. Uh, and this is one of my favorite examples of that. So this is from Reddit, I imagine some people in here have seen it before. But um, so Reddit uh, is sort of the underarm of the internet. Uh, it's a social community with very, very few constraints on what can happen there. Uh, and what that allows is some really awful things and some really beautiful things to emerge. Um, and one of them was, uh, somebody just asked this question. So if someone from the 1950s suddenly appeared today, what would be the most difficult thing to explain to them about the way we live? And this answer just got it. So I possess a device in my pocket that is capable of accessing the entirety of information known to man. I use it to look at pictures of cats and get there. <laughs> That's the internet. <laughs> because while technology and our technological capabilities have changed very rapidly, human nature hasn't really changed at all. Um, and yet, um, this is a photo I use whenever I talk about social data. So this is Obama on the campaign trail in his first campaign, and he's there in Germany uh, cheering to a crowd of tens of thousands. Um, and every single person in this photo has a device. Every single person is generating data, they're sharing this experience, it is a social networked experience they're all having together. Uh, and we uh, were not really prepared for this. Um, so I work at Bitly, and I'll use Bitly through my talk sort of as an example uh, and from my own experience, but in no way am I holding it up as the right way to do anything. Um, and I, I will start by saying, in fact, Bitly itself was a complete accident. Um, Bitly was part of a, a feature of another product. So we spun out of a company called Betaworks, and Betaworks had this brilliant idea that when you're reading a news article on the internet, uh, other people are reading that article at the same time, and yet our experience of that is very lonely. It is not in any way social. So they thought, well, what if we added a social layer to news consumption? And they built a system that was at the time called Firefly, and it would let you see the mouse cursors of everybody else on the news article with you. Um, and so you can guess what happened then. Uh, it was not, the entire idea was to open this new age of social discourse around shared news consumption, and it was in fact the exact opposite. So people started swearing at each other, they would like chase each other around the screen, um, and it was horrible. Uh, it had the, the opposite social effect that the product was intended to have, but two different things that were useful came out of it. One of them was Bitly, which was a, just a little way to share bits of content in that tool. Um, this was around the same time Twitter was getting started, and so, you know, for unconnected reasons, it became very convenient to have short URLs and analytics. And another company, which is our sister company in New York called Chartbeat, that does real-time um, heat maps of uh, action on a publisher's site, because it turns out, as a consumer of the news, you do not care who else is doing what else on that site, but as the publisher, you very much care how people are flowing through that information. So I always say that data should give us superpowers, and it's not just because I grew up reading comic books and really uh, loving science fiction, but because I do believe that the data we have access to and the technical tools we have access to give us abilities that human beings have never had before. That ability to have almost all of human knowledge in our pocket 
the ability to know what people in China are thinking about a current news event instantly. Um, so data should give us superpowers. And there are a couple of things that made this possible now. Um, and what's really interesting about it is that there was no new, there was no, there was really no transistor of big data. There was no fundamental change in the world, no logarithm where before a day nothing was possible and after a day everything was possible. Um, big data hasn't been like that at all. Uh, it was a slow reduction of friction and cost in building these kinds of systems. And slowly we have uh, eased our way into this. And the key thing that changed was actually a very simple thing. Uh, two lines in a graph crossed. It became cheaper to keep data than it cost to throw it away. So it is actually cheaper to not pay a sysadmin or an operations team to rotate logs than it is to just store them somewhere forever. So simple, and yet uh, it has a huge effect. So no talk like this uh, can proceed without actually addressing the buzzwords head on. I'm not a huge fan of the phrase big data um, for two reasons. Um, one is that there are, the non-technical definition tends to be something like data that won't fit in Excel anymore. And, <laughs> um, that's fine, and I know if we have anyone from Microsoft in the audience, we're working on it. Um, I keep hearing that. Uh, but that's not a very technical definition. And so the technical definition that uh, gets used most often is data that you cannot analyze on one compute node. So data that requires a specialized infrastructure in order to even do simple calculations like counts or look at distributions. And that's fine also, except what I can analyze on this laptop is a, a huge amount larger than what I can analyze on the laptop I had five years ago. Which means that this definition also is relative, and that bothers me. Um, so the definition of big data that I will use is that it is data made useful. And again, it's useful to the human mind. So the reason big data systems are interesting is that I, as a researcher or engineer, can actually ask a question of a large amount of data and get the answer back before I forget why I asked the question in the first place. <laughs> And again, it's not so much a fundamental uh, switch or change, but the fact that a query that used to take a month can take a day, uh, or a query that took a day can take minutes. Uh, and it really changes the way you can work with data. You no longer have to know that the query you're running is valuable, you can actually play. And that's why I think this is really cool. Also, because data um, is often a side effect of something else, and one of the phrases that we use a lot is data exhaust, in that um, you're on a social network, you're talking to your mom, or looking at a friend's baby photos, you're creating data, but you're not deliberately creating data, you're not thoughtful about the data you create, it is a side effect of the behavior. That that data can then be used to reinforce or uh, guide you in that product is an interesting system. So the superpowers we have today are still uh, really simple. We count things. And that's pretty much what most of it is. Right? We count things, and Hadoop is a system for highly distributed counting. Um, and you can quote me on that. Um, that lets us take data like this. So this is what you actually, what we see when somebody clicks on a bit.ly link. And so for the nerds in the room, this will look pretty familiar. Um, you can see it has the user agent, the uh, location in terms of city, state, country, uh, the actual short link that was clicked, the social network it came from, which is Facebook, the URL itself, timestamps, that kind of stuff. Um, this isn't pretty to humans, but this is. Most of what we do is just counting things up in interesting ways. Um, the second generation, which we're starting to see more and more, is counting things more cleverly. Um, and by that, I mean we're actually counting for a purpose of building products. And so this is one that everybody here must have seen before. It is your Netflix recommendations. Um, I heard a beautiful story. I have no idea if it's true, but that, um, well, both Netflix and Amazon recommendations sort of suck. Um, Netflix <laughs> suck because they're biasing you towards the back end of the catalog where they pay lower licensing fees. And Amazon suck because they're biasing you towards the very front of the catalog where they actually have things in stock. I don't know if that's true, but I thought it was a nice story. Um, 
we'll get back to that topic too. But we're starting to see a generation of data products, uh, which are really interesting. I wanted to give a few examples. This is my favorite one of all time. I, am in, I talk about them all the time, so you should know I'm in no way affiliated with these guys. Um, this is a website called forecast.io, or if you have an iPhone, uh, you can get an app called Dark Sky, and it costs like $4. It's totally worth it. They take the public US government weather prediction data, they take your current GPS location on your device, and they give you a micro forecast for where you are standing. So they tell you, it is going to rain in five minutes, and it will rain heavily for 10 minutes, and then it will stop. It is awesome. Um, especially if you live in New York, where it takes about 10 minutes to get to any subway. Uh, it's an amazing piece of technology. And it's a great data product because they are putting the data in a visualization that is immediately useful to you in the context you're in. So another one that's worth talking about is, um, is not exactly a product, but this is Mike Flowers, who is the Chief Analytics Officer of the City of New York. And uh, he has a team, he's great. So his career before he was an analytics officer was busting organized crime. He's a lawyer for the city. Um, and he's a team of statisticians who work with him um, who are all you know, uh, fairly recently out of school and he calls them his nerds in a very affectionate way. Um, and they're basically counting things for the benefit of New York City. So they did one project where they were able to find the map on the screen. This is him speaking at Data Gotham, which was a conference we held last September, and we'll be holding again next September. The map here is a map of uh, grease pickups. So every restaurant in New York uh, generates a lot of grease. We probably don't really want to dwell on that, but um, <laughs> they need to send it off somewhere, and unfortunately, some of them choose to dump it down the sewers. And this is a huge cost uh, to the city and disgusting. Um, and so his team managed to figure out which restaurants were most likely to be dumping their grease illegally. And instead of finding them, he actually went and partnered with a clean energy company who would come in and buy the grease. So instead of going in and trying to give them a ticket, they came in and said, hey, look, we know your business is tough. Uh, do you have grease? Because you can sell it to these guys for a couple hundred dollars uh, and it will save you, you know, the problem of getting rid of it. And they, um, they managed to reduce that problem just by counting things and then actually working with people in a way that was a win for the city and for the business owners. Um, and his team did another amazing project uh, on ambulances. So it turns out the city of New York operates 300 ambulances and generally, one will live in the firehouse, and the others will roam around the precinct waiting for a call. And they went and calculated the optimal point for each ambulance to sit uh, based on the distribution of locations of likely calls, which makes a lot of sense. But then it turns out, of course, the ambulances don't sit anywhere near those points. So instead of sending them a letter or something and telling them what to do, they actually went and they talked to the ambulance drivers. And they said, why are you sitting where you're sitting? And the driver said, well, we need a 24-hour coffee and a bathroom. <laughs> Those are correlated, probably. <laughs> and uh, so they went and said, OK, well, what if you sit by this 24-hour coffee shop instead? Uh, it's closer to the optimal point. And they actually managed to cut ambulance response times down in Manhattan by a minute. Yeah, that's probably saving people's lives just by counting things. It's awesome. And that's the very beginning. Um, so to switch tracks a little bit, in the process of building data products, um, we don't generally think about archiving preservation, um, well, generally only in a failure case. Uh, and so I'm very much hoping that this talk is the first talk to this group ever to involve animated GIFs, and we'll see if this actually works, um, because, oh no, oh wait. <laughs> yes, that's working. All right. Um, yeah. So admittedly, we see a lot of animated GIFs, um, and they have. It, it's actually a like totally fascinating topic in the way that uh, the technology has not changed at all in ten years, and yet suddenly they have emerged as this hugely emotionally expressive tool for people. Um, right. So, so we don't use this phrase, digital preservation. Um, we don't really know. Uh, what it means, but it, but it is something that startups should be very concerned about 
Because what happens uh, when you encounter a catastrophic failure? Um, <laughs> that is something startups are very concerned with. Uh, and if you want to see more GIFs like this, I highly recommend spending some time on Tumblr. Um, there's a whole set of sub blogs uh, where people just uh, talk about their emotions in the face of certain events. Um, but there are a lot of challenges in getting that kind of thinking even to be part of the conversation. Uh, and in the broader community, um, those of us working at startups have a lot of challenges around making our data useful. Um, and so I have an academic background, though I usually say that what made me a poor academic makes me good at working in a startup, which is a short attention span and a desire to hack things up quickly. Um, so in academia, there's currently in my field uh, no access to data. So the people who have the intellectual freedom to do amazing work have no data. And those of us who have data have actual jobs and are a little busy. And so just, just to highlight this for you, this is um, ICWSM, which is um, one of the best conferences in social media research. And just from the list of papers, I've highlighted in red the ones that could plausibly actually own the data they were writing about. Every paper title here in white is about Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, there was one about Billy, you know, uh, systems where it was very clear the authors did not own the data. They were very lucky if they were able to get privileged access to that data. Um, and this just goes on. I mean, it's a huge problem. Uh, the same problem can be expanded to the general population in that there is a distinct asymmetry between those who generate the data and those who have it, meaning that we are all generating the data when we talk about social data. Uh, and yet this data is possessed as a proprietary asset by a very small number of companies. Bitly is a bit of an oddity in that it's a very small company that um, opens up as much of the data as we possibly have been able to so far. But um, outside of Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, uh, Microsoft, and Google, you really can't get access to this kind of data. We also have no idea what the implications are for data that's aggregated. Uh, and there does not, as far as I know, exist an economic model that can tell us uh, how to value data as a good. So the closest model my economist friends have told me about is the one that um, models shoes. So your left shoe isn't worth anything unless you also have the right shoe, and then it can become quite valuable. Um, but shoes don't scale to billions of data points. So the interesting thing about social data is that your data is essentially useless when it's an individual data point. It only gains value in the aggregate. And we don't really have any other goods uh, that follow that sort of model. I won't even really say the P word. I don't actually think the thing we're talking about is privacy. Um, though obviously given what's going on in the government, um, it's a huge issue right now, and um, watching the news coverage closely it has told me only that we don't even have the vocabulary to have the right conversation. Uh, there are two separate issues that people are conflating. Uh, one is that um, we now no longer control how far outside our control our data goes, so I release a piece of data and it can be globally public, um, and that's that. And we also have no right to know who possesses what data about us and what they're doing with it. So if a company collects data about me, I don't even have a right to know that. Uh, and I certainly don't have a right to delete it or stop it. And that's not even talking about metadata, which gets way more interesting. And so um, to lighten the mood a bit, let's talk about pizza. I'm from New York, we love pizza. Uh, if you live in New York and you click on bit.ly links about pizza, these are the words you are reading. Do we actually, are there any other New Yorkers here? And maybe not, okay, a few, right? So New Yorkers like cheese pizza. Um, one of the common questions tourists ask when they come to New York is where do I get a slice of New York pizza? And it's a terrible question because it is all New York pizza. Right? Um, if you go to San Francisco, and ask that question. <laughs> These are the words people in San Francisco read when they are reading documents about pizza. Um, and I don't know what this bullshit is, right? <laughs> and at the same time, these are the words being read by people in Rome. Um, and since they invented it and they seem to like cheese, I don't really speak Italian, um, we'll let them get away with it here. 
Um, but this, I chose this as an example. We did this through Bitly and it's silly, um, but it's an example of how uh, the meta geography was interesting in studying otherwise a very simple action, just click some documents about pizza. Uh, we can take that further in that this is something we did with Forbes where we looked at the relative influence of national media um, by state. So for each national publication, you see there on the left, uh, we looked at their deviation from the mean uh, clicks by state. It's a very simple math. Um, but we found a few things that were really interesting in that Fox News is disproportionately consumed in Texas, which I guess we all knew that probably, in the New York Times in New York. Um, NPR in Oregon, apparently there are a lot of hippies there. And uh, The Onion in Wisconsin. <laughs> Wisconsin is apparently awesome. Uh, we have a new project as well with WNYC where they're tracking the New York mayoral race very closely. Uh, and you are actually able to see differences in the articles about the candidates being read by a borough of New York City. So what people are reading about Christine's Quinn in Staten Island is really different than what they're reading in Manhattan. So metadata. Um, yeah, we haven't even started that conversation. Uh, and another thing that, uh, that has come up a lot when I talk to larger companies in particular that are starting a data practice or they find they have a bunch of data and they don't really know what to do with it, um, is that you can't plan and budget for what you haven't discovered yet. And so the practice of working with data is very much it is the scientific method. You have a theory, you do an experiment or some sort of query. You try to validate that and make sure it makes sense in the context you're in. And what um, a lot of people fear is that as our products are built around data, we will lose that question of surprise and delay. So to go back to making fun of Amazon, um, this is what you get if you search for the Da Vinci Code. And if you can't read it, it is a bunch of other Dan Brown books. And I assure you, it is not surprising or delightful, and perhaps, well, I mean, maybe it is. If you're really into that, that's fine. But it's not uh, novel. Um, and so, in general, I like to protest situations like this. Um, and I had the flu in January, and I made this site called Book Book Goose, where I crawled 300,000 books out of Amazon's library. And you can see them randomly. So it just shows you uh, books randomly. And that was, uh, as a protest against both the idea of the tyranny of the algorithm and the algorithm itself, and to provide a baseline for which a better algorithm can be tested against. I know I've said this already, but um, we're just at the beginning of making data actually useful for us. And if you are really interested in the question of metadata, one of the best essays I've seen recently was this one by Karen Healy. Um, and that's a bit.ly link to it if you want to load it up right now. Um, he basically talks about how you could have identified Paul Revere as the rebel um, just by looking at the social metadata without looking at the content of any of the communications. It's really brilliantly written. Right. So I'm a data scientist, and we're seeing lots of people with uh, job titles like data scientists. I do actually think it is a useful title because um, it's not that data scientists do anything that BI engineers or analysts haven't done for many, many years. It's that the technology has gotten so much more approachable and easier to use that you no longer have to specialize. Um, like I've met people who are Quantcast analysts and they, the tools are so difficult to use that their whole job was one tool. Uh, and we now live in a world where that is not the case, where a data scientist can come with the engineering background to build a system to look at data, the math background to actually uh, build a model that represents the data robustly, and the other piece, which is, if not the domain knowledge, to know what they're looking at and put it in the right context, at least the communication skills to sit down with the person who has that domain knowledge. So we, we can actually find that in one person. And we're still defining what people in that role need to know to be effective professionals and human beings. So let's talk a bit about how we build data products today. Um, and I'll use one of the cars for Bitly as an example, but I think it's uh, a fairly, it's a, the same process that every other company I know is using. Uh, and it's not a very good process, actually. So first you collect some data. 
um, either you collect it by accident or you collect it after you've actually built a thing and you realized you haven't been collecting the right data. Um, generally, I see people start with their Apache log files and they realize those are terrible and so they build something better. You do offline research on that data to validate some hypothesis. So um, that may involve a new job or you know, just letting your computer sit for some hours to say, okay, I'm gonna try a model of this data in some way. Once you've done that, you can build a system around that data. Uh, the difference here between traditional software engineering and data system engineering is that the design of the infrastructure for a data system is itself in part dictated by the nature of the data from flowing through that system. That's fairly new. The only time we even think about it is when we think about backing things up. So we only think about preservation in terms of failure prevention. Uh, and this is another favorite from the internet. You guys need to spend more time on Tumblr. <laughs> so I'll give you an example, and the example I'm gonna talk about is a system my team built at Bitly called rt.ly, which is real time, um, and it's, you need a Bitly account to use it, but you can go ahead and load it up if you're playing with it. Um, it lets you do queries like this, so I did this yesterday. This is what people uh, in Alexandria, Virginia, which is where we are physically located right now, were reading disproportionately. Um, and this works by uh, taking the location of every click on a particular link and looking at the entropy of that distribution. And if it's highly skewed, we say, okay, it's disproportionately interesting to people in this location. It's also a fun little trick because uh, the location data is really uninteresting for me individual, but in aggregate, it becomes quite useful. And uh, you can see they were, they care about the royal birth here, though everybody did a corpse flower is in bloom. And I don't, I think the last ones are their barbecue or sports. Um, and this system works on three different features. So search being able to say, of the tens of billions of pages, um, find me one that matches a query. I know what I want to find. And you can do a query like this. This is my favorite all-time query, which is stories about food being read in Brooklyn, New York. Um, we can always find good truths that way. Um, the problem with real-time search is that often you don't know what you're looking for because you want to know what the world is paying attention to, so what's unexpectedly getting attention right now? And this is a really fun one because it actually involves some really interesting modeling. So the idea is that we'll look for phrases in the content where they're receiving a burst of attention. So the actual rate of clicks on phrases, that is the clicks per second, is uh, more than two standard deviations above our expected based on historical mean. So we did some research and came up with a model. Um, we don't have to go through math, but um, basically the idea is we took an integral, we experimented with a lot of historical data and managed to simplify it down to a sum drawn from a biased distribution because we understand what the, the function of a, a click sum link look like. And we picked that distribution uh, so we get an interpretable model out of the data, which means that um, for various reasons, binning clicks and looking at that isn't a useful metric for this. We have a better way of calculating clicks per second. And then we actually built a data store that puts those clicks per second models into the data store. So there's no calculation that's running. You get it for free. Uh, and it lets us build graphs like this. So at the time I made this graph, Bitcoin was in the news and getting a lot of attention. That's the rate of clicks per second on the y-axis and time on the x. And Angelina Jolie had just released this article um, about her medical decisions, and you can see she, she's a celebrity, she's always getting some attention, but then there was a huge spike in interest in her, and it was for this article. And people writing articles about this article. And so this is a system that, in memory, is tracking 600 million key phrases, that is, n grams up to 5 grams, um, in all languages we can find on the internet. Um, that's cool, but I'm sure someone here has a bigger one. Um, we also uh, realized after we built those first two pieces that, um, and this is probably something obvious, uh, people don't consume information on a link by link basis. They want to know about a story or uh, some knowledge. So we built a system that dynamically aggregates together all of the different links about the same real world event. And so this is when we were debugging it, again, building that offline model thing. 
what is Obama up to? Can we group all the different things he's up to into different story clusters by color? Um, and this now lets us understand and analyze stories as a collection of links uh, in one interface. And it turns out actually the time dynamics of story consumption are quite different than the way people read any individual link, which I find totally fascinating. We're just beginning to work on this. Um, and if you go to the homepage, you get whatever is hot at the moment, and I threw this in you know, maybe a couple hours ago, so the current hot stories in the world are the Motorola Droid design and something about soccer and Lady Gaga being naked, which I cropped off at the bottom, but if you want to see it, it's still on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing gets a lot of attention. Um, and so this is one example of a data system we are trying to build to help give this experience to people where they're, they're you know, consuming knowledge in its natural environment, or at least perceiving that, um, while also giving them that superpower of having access they would never otherwise have access to. All right. So I have a bunch of questions for you, and then I will stop talking, and we will um, have time for a discussion, I think. Um, and the first one is really, how do we make preservation a primary goal of system design rather than not just a secondary goal, but a mostly forgotten goal? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, how do we respect our data? Um, and this is a broader issue in that in our community, by which I mean the startup uh, and data product community, there are currently no best practices for respecting data, respecting data about people. Um, it is the industry standard to sell every bit of PII you can to uh, people who will target ads based on that cookie data. Those systems don't actually appear to work, and yet a huge amount of money perpetuates that machine forward. Um, we have so far built a business where we have not sold that data, um, but I call this the vegetarian model of doing business, and that we live in a privileged world where we can make that decision. Um, but as soon as you know we have no money in the bank or someone else buys our company, that model will go away. If you're alone starving in the woods, I'm pretty sure you need a rabbit. Right? Um, and so this is what I see as one of the biggest challenges for our data product community going forward is how do we respect people? Um, how do we build products that are actually empowering to people and not disempowering? Um, and how do we do business around that? Because this is a for-profit world. Uh, and if anyone uh, runs into me awkwardly in the coffee line later and wants to have something to talk about, ask me about Lindsay. All right. Thank you very much. We have time for questions, and that's at least my favorite part of any discussion. Does anyone have a question? Please. I feel like I ask a variation of this question every time I have the opportunity. So where in the, um, is this on, um, digital stewardship um, and historical memory community? And so our perspective is longitudinal backwards, right? So we're looking towards the future, trying to figure out what to preserve, how long to keep it. And what you're doing is monitoring the now. And I'd like to hear you talk about what you see in that model if we're collecting um, you know, starting from the beginning of digital culture and collecting forwards, what, what would you like to see? What do you think the opportunities are for analyzing that data and doing something interesting going backwards from the future? So I think the question is asking, like, how, how do we think about, from that long-term perspective, uh, storing, processing, so how would we prepare ourselves now for a more awesome future, basically? Um, and that is a really hard question. Um, though I can tell you the perspective we've taken on it, which has been um, guided by pragmatism, in that you simply can't afford to save everything. Um, so you can save the second order, the metadata, which is what we've done at Bitly. We have you know, every URL mapping for all time. We have the keywords extracted from every page we've ever crawled, even if we haven't saved the crawled content because we just can't afford to. Um, so you want to save enough that you've represented the essence of the object uh, without having to store the entire thing. 
And then you have the added challenge of storing things um, that don't exist in a finite set of dimensions. So um, yeah, that's a big challenge. Um, the only, I mean, the only way I think we can even think about it is to consider systems that are additive. So if I store one piece of data for whatever reason, I am incentivized to do that and you store another, can we actually build an interface between those things such that we can do even more interesting work uh, eventually? Because otherwise, you, you just can't afford to save everything. Please. Um, uh, economics of long-term storage is something I've been working on, and there's actually a, a conflict between what you said earlier, which is cheap it, keep it, and throw it away, and now you're saying you can't afford to keep it. And the problem <coughs> is actually a bigger problem than that, because, uh, for example, the Library of Congress is actually getting the Twitter feed but they can't afford to provide access in any meaningful way to that because the infrastructure to provide the access would be too expensive. And so we're in this, uh, all of us really are in this um, cost benefit trade-off about deciding what to keep. And uh, it's very difficult because actually the, the deciding is expensive too. So. I'm interested more on, on your thoughts about what's likely to be what, what's likely to be good strategies for deciding what to what keep. That's a very good question. And I do just want to clarify, um, when I said it, it's cheaper to keep the data than to throw it away, I meant the, um, the transactional, the fundamental data that we create that is unique. And so what we keep for all time at Bitly is the mapping of short to long URL, the data around the creation of that link and the data around every click on that link. Um, and then we keep some metadata we extract from that content for all time as well. We do not keep the content itself for all time. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that, but the base justification is that that is something that can be regenerated if we ever need it again. So we can, someone else has taken on the responsibility for that content. It's not ours, it's on the New York Times site, it's on some other site, we can go pull it down again. Um, so that's that line. Um, but it, it is, it's a really hard question. Um, how do you store something that represents the essence of an object that is a compact and robust representation of it without uh, incurring the cost of storing it? And then what you alluded to is how do you even build the infrastructure to index that store uh, in a cost-effective way? I mean, we have um, 